Hello, everyone. Welcome to Computer Science E7. Uh, this is lecture two when we talk about software, and in the latter half, we start talking about some light. So um, I just want to quickly mention some things that we discussed last time, uh, just to make sure that everybody understands. Uh, a camera is not required for this course. Uh, you might find it easier to have one, but you don't have to rush out and buy one, especially since they, are, they cost some money. We do have some cameras available, these Panasonic Lumix digital cameras available for rent uh, from the Church Street Lab. You can get these at 53 Church Street. Just go in and you might have to show your ID and, or give them your ID while you rent it. But uh, these have the capabilities uh, for you to be able to perform all of the assignments throughout the semester. So you can't unfortunately rent it for the duration of the semester. I believe the limit is for 24 hours. But you can, uh, you'll be able to very easily uh, complete the assignments or relatively easily complete the assignments if you don't have a camera by going to rent one of these. And uh, we actually are starting sections this week. And so we've released not only a schedule of sections here on this slide, but also on the website so that you can go and, and verify what time these are. These start today. Uh, and the first one is after class in 53 Church Street, number 104. That's, that'll be led by John Selig, who stepped out for just a moment. Um, but uh, these are meant to be uh, more informal than lectures are, and they'll be a little bit smaller, and so you'll, it'll be much more uh, discussion-based, much more question and answer sort of thing. So, and they'll be used to go over material that uh, needs to go over again. So maybe if, if there's something that you didn't quite understand from lecture, because I do talk very fast, especially when I start getting really excited about this stuff, um, and we'll slow it down a little bit. And uh, they may not last the whole two hours, so you don't have to plan for it lasting two hours, but uh, that's, that's up to John, and he'll have more details about that um, during sections. So uh, when... Uh, we're talking about digital cameras. Last week, we were talking a lot about the cameras themselves. So we, we talked a little bit about the history, and uh, we broke down an SLR and showed you some of the internals of it, the, uh, the mirror, the, the shutter, a variety of things that make it, makes it physically work, and so how, how it physically directs the light into the camera uh, and captures the light onto the sensor. But being digital, we can't worry just about the hardware. We're probably going to need to do something with the photos once we have taken them. We can't just, uh, uh, and, and though I think um, my mom might be guilty of this, we can't just leave them on the camera uh, for infinity and, and expect it to do something automatically. We usually have to have some additional software uh, to do something with the photos. And so uh, whether it's complex software like uh, some of the previews up here on, on screen or some simpler software that comes with your computer, iPhoto on Macs, for example, or whatever Windows uses these days, I don't even, I'm not even sure, you have to be able to download the photos onto your computer and you usually want to be able to manipulate them in some way, whether that is a lot of manipulation using, for example, the, the, the archetypal Photoshop that everybody seems to use these days, uh, or whether you want to do some more advanced work with, uh, with raw files, which you might use one of the, uh, the, the two pieces of software up top, so Phase One, Capture One, for example, or Apple's Aperture, or even Adobe's Lightroom, really depends on what you are trying to get out of these uh, pieces of software and also um, what you want to do with the photos. And uh, all of these software, all of this software ranges in price from free that comes with your computer all the way up to ludicrous amounts of money. And uh, so you don't have to jump out and, and spend any money to purchase this software uh, right away uh, until you realize what it can do for you and, and until you figure out which one might actually do what you want it to. And in fact, even the, these uh, applications that are listed up here each serve a relatively different purpose. So Photoshop, everybody knows as being the uh, application that you will want to use to modify images in some significant way. And in fact, uh, uh, we are going to be spending a lot of time focusing on Photoshop throughout this course when we're talking about software tools. Not uh, Today is, is more of an intro to that, but in, in later software tools lectures, we really dive into Photoshop and we see how we can do some very specific tasks with digital photographs in Photoshop. But once you start uh, taking a lot of photos, and maybe you're taking them not only in JPEG format, but also in, the, in your camera's RAW format, you realize that you're going to have to do some additional processing on them. So you might have to purchase some software like 
uh, Adobe's Lightroom or Apple's Aperture in order to organize and process your photos. Uh, there are other pieces of software available as well. For a long time, iView Media Pro was, was uh, a popular choice among professionals. Now, I don't, it's, it seems to have fallen by the wayside a little bit, but it was very good at the time, very good organizational tool to help, um, help you categorize and tag your photos and find them later, especially if you're taking lots and lots and lots of photos. Phase one, capture one, that's, um, this software, they have various versions of it, but it is also raw processing software. And so when we're talking about raw photos, uh, we'll talk more about them in detail at a later time, but basically they're just sort of the raw data that's coming out of your camera rather than being processed into a JPEG file, into that JPEG format that's lossy as we described before. Raw is not a lossy format, so you preserve a lot of the original quality and a lot of the original data that JPEG just simply cannot store. And so this usually means that you have to work a little bit more after the fact to be able to get all of the quality out of that raw file that you possibly can. And so that's what uh, some of this other software like Phase One, Capture One will actually do for you. And so organizing your photos um, uh, is, is really a question of, of personal preference. Now, some of you may prefer just using folders and files to do this. Um, and this is perfectly fine, but there's a problem with this and that is that uh, it becomes, um, well, well, I should talk about the pros first. The, the pro is that it's free, it's easy to use, you, you can set up your organization however you like, um, but the problem is that you are then bound by that specific organizational tool. There's n really no other way to search for your files. You can't tag them with specific keywords, for example, and, and be able to search for them later on. And so this is what uh, a couple of software tools try to remedy uh, so this is a, a screen capture of, of iView Media Pro back when I used to use it. And uh, as you can see, it shows you a lot more information about the photos than you would get in just having them be on your, on your folder structure on your computer. Um, and in this case, it not only tells you the name of the file, but it also shows you a preview of it, which in most modern operating systems you could actually show as well. But what you wouldn't normally see is uh, a lot of the information that is provided by uh, the photo as well, such as some of the exposure details, the ISO speed, how it was metered, what, whether flash was used or not, so on and so forth. And uh, this, using this software, you could tag the photos with keywords, which you could go back and search for later and, and find them in, uh, in a variety of ways. You can see there's a search bar in the upper right-hand corner so that you could type in keywords, look for it, and search. Uh, there's, I mean, there's a variety of, of very useful features within the software, but there was a problem with this as well, and that was that it put all of your photos in one long list. If you see, uh, you can see that on the right here, there's six photos that are visible, but there's also a scroll bar, and you can see that the, uh, it actually will scroll for quite a long distance, and, that, and this is just to show that once you start adding more and more photos, it's hard to just sort of visually scan and find specific images within it. So um, modern uh, organizational tools and raw tools uh, such as Aperture or Lightroom, if you, if you take a lot of photos, you will probably end up using one of these two pieces of software, if not a, a competitor uh, that exists today. And uh, using one of these, you can actually get a lot more organizational help out of it. So you can arrange it not only by, uh, by tagging and by providing keywords to it, but you can also give them a folder structure, a file hierarchy that exists within it. So if you can see in this, in this left side over here, uh, there is, there's some small folders and, and, uh, and projects, as they call them, that you can use to organize your photos. And so this isn't meant to be uh, an advertisement for software, but just to show you what I think after working with this stuff for so long works and what doesn't work. And so um, it's taken me a long time to come to a photo organization that's like this or, or something that's relatively simple, but I've broken it down into relatively few categories. So you could break some of these up into further categories or even combine some of them depending on what you are working on in your particular photos. Um, but I found that this seems to work out pretty well for me. So I have, for example, a folder for jobs. So uh, something where I was hired to take some photos for something. All those photos go into jobs. So personal, that's stuff that's more fun. That's, those are photos that I take for myself, probably in my home or, or uh, what have you. And so places, that's, 
it's, it's usually meant to be a little bit more local, so something like the Boston area or any of the, uh, the smaller cities surrounding Cambridge or what have you, any of these places, Burlington, Arlington, and so on and so forth. Uh, something that isn't really a devoted uh, trip or a vacation necessarily, but just something that I might visit on a quasi-regular basis. Then, of course, things and projects. These are not jobs in the sense that I wasn't paid for them, but these are things that I've been working on. So maybe I have uh, a set of photos that I want to manipulate in Photoshop, and I, will, and I want to have one place to work on them there. That might be the, the place for that. Then trips is pretty self-explanatory, I think, and work uh, deals with photos that I might take for my day jobs or for E7, for example. So I have a whole bunch of E7 photos in here related mostly to pinhole cameras. So if I were to expand this, you would see a whole bunch of pinhole photos from, uh, from a variety of semesters. Now, another thing that's useful when you're organizing your photos is to use ratings. Uh, so um, you can usually, in, in software, rate photos but with a given number of stars. And so sometimes it, rate, it ranges from zero to five stars, for example. Maybe you're given more or less. And uh, it took me also a long time to figure out how to use this effectively as well, because I realized that I was spending a lot of time just sitting there thinking, well, is this a four or a three? And I would think, you know, I really wish I had 3.5, but then I said, okay, no, this is getting to be a little bit too much. And so my workflow now involves using ratings to try to help me narrow down the photos that I want. So let's say I import hundreds of photos and I need to be able to process them. I need to go through them and select a subset of them that I want to display on Flickr or on my website, so on and so forth, or send to my family, for example. Then what I might do is go through each of them one by one and just rate it individually as three stars or fewer. If it's three stars, that means I think it's a worthwhile photo. Uh, it doesn't have any major technical flaws that detracts from the photo. It's a photo that I think could be interesting. Maybe it needs some work, something like that. Something that I think is interesting in a worthwhile photo, I'll give a rating of three and move on. Then from there, I will rate other photos a one or a two just based on how crappy I think it is, frankly. And by the end, so I've gone through a whole bunch of photos, maybe hundreds of photos, but doing this makes me go through them quickly. And that way, I can just move on and start processing them. So then I only view the photos that are three stars, and then I go through them a second time. And so by now, you will hopefully have decreased the number of photos at least in half, probably, hopefully, a lot less. Then you, when you go through it, it's a lot less painful, and you can spend more time looking at each photo individually and saying, OK, this photo, you know, it's, it's a great photo, but it has, it's slightly out of focus, or it's slightly blurry. And while I could spend some time working on this, it's not definitely not five star worthy. So maybe I'll decide to keep it a three star. If it has significant, uh, or if, it's, if it has some promise, maybe a four star. And just narrow it down and keep narrowing it down until eventually you get to a collection of four star photos. And those are the ones that you should spend time with and work on them and correct them. So while you can begin correcting some of these photos and, and uh, in, in correcting, I mean doing a variety of software tasks such as enhancing the contrast, fixing the color, really anything that you would do in software. I don't recommend that you start touching that stuff until you've narrowed it down a little bit because then you're going to have a huge task ahead of you if you're taking a lot of photos to try to manipulate a sub, or if you're, if you're trying to manipulate all of them, it's just going to become overwhelming and you will quickly find that it is not something that you want to spend a lot of time on. And frankly, even with myself, um, if, for those of you that have uh, already joined the Flickr group, if you uh, were, were stalking some of my, my Flickr photos, you may have noticed that I added a whole bunch of them recently, and that's because I had a backlog. I hate processing photos, but I love taking them. So I, will, I end up with thousands of photos that I have to go through, and then it's just such a pain to be able to go through it. And so anything that can be used, even to just help me just the tiniest bit to become faster processing these photos, helps significantly. And one of these ways is using uh, a workflow like that, where you just narrow it down and narrow it down and narrow it down continuously until you get to a small subset of photos that you want to work with. So this leads us to keywords. I used to be um, really gung-ho about keywords and tagging them, providing uh, specific words to photos that perhaps describe it in some way. And so this got, this got to such a ridiculous point and I was using iView Media Pro that if a, if a photo had a tree in it, I would put a keyword of tree. If it had a shadow that was potentially interesting, I would, and I would put, label it a shadow. And so 
now when, I, when I've, I've moved to Aperture and it's imported all of those keywords, and the first few versions of Aperture, just as a small anecdote, were really kind of slow. And importing all of those keywords just made it absolutely unbearable because there's thousands of keywords and I've collapsed them all here. Uh, you can see there's an iView Media Pro keyword that has a bunch. If I clicked on that arrow and expanded it, we would be waiting several minutes for it to just keep working and show us all of the keywords. And it gets really ridiculous. Now, where I think keywords are useful is if you sell your photos, for example, in stock photography. So in stock photography, what you have to do is try to market your photos based on its content. So if you are taking a photo of, um, oh, I don't know, somebody that's doing accounting work, for example, you might have somebody in, in glasses, you know, you could do the stereotype, uh, with have somebody in glasses with a, a pen protector working on a calculator, for example, and you might then want to keyword each of these specific things because that will help expand your marketing for that particular photo. But if it's just for yourself, I've noticed that you really don't have to tag photos quite so much. You don't have to worry about it so much. And in fact, the, really the only keywords that I use are involved in this hierarchy, in this organization here. So I know that uh, if I want a lot of trees, for example, that maybe I want to go to some main trips where there's, I know that there's probably, I took, probably took photos of a lot of trees. So I'd go into trips and then look through some of the trips there, see if I could find one that was related to that. So I could use context of the photo to try to find some of these keywords. However, it really depends, of course, on what you want to do with this. So maybe you take a lot of uh, pictures of people, of your friends and of your family. You might want to have some keywords just of your friends and family so that you can tag your photos with, um, with those names so that you can easily find them later. There is actually some software, though. Um, I don't think uh, Aperture or Lightroom will do it. I think iPhoto, for example, will do this, where it'll try to automatically process each of your photos and find faces within them and then try to figure out whose face it is. So if you label a couple of photos with, um, with a name, uh, then it will associate all future photos with uh, that name and, and it'll actually show you that person's face. And so I tried it because it sounded kind of cool, but it, I don't think it works that well yet. I think they have to work on it a little bit. But it definitely is um, some, some neat technology. And if that's something that, that you want versus having a lot of uh, keyword specificity, then you might want to consider using some simpler software. Now, when we're talking about um, organization and keywords, you have to realize that the photos that you take in your camera actually have a lot of data embedded within it, something that you don't actually see when you're just viewing the picture on your screen or maybe even on your camera. There's a lot of detail about that photo that is recorded within the file and it's transferred onto, onto your computer with the file. It's actually a part of the file that is not visible. And uh, any good photo organization program will show this data to you. And it can be very useful to you to try to figure out some of, to, uh, to try to figure out how, these, how this photo was taken or what settings you used and how you want to be able to change it in the future. So we can see that for this particular photo, it was taken on a specific date with a specific camera using specific settings. And we can use that to our advantage. And in fact, um, using this data, this is called EXIF metadata, and this is data that Flickr uses as well. Whenever you look at a Flickr photo, well, I don't have one available, so this could take me a while, but whenever you look at a photo, there's usually a button that says more info. And when you click on that button, it usually tells you all of this same data that was provided to you from, uh, from the camera. And um, this helps us, so it doesn't it not only helps you, but it also helps us because when we say that you should be using some specific settings on your camera, that you should be within some certain exposure range or something like that, we actually look at this data to make sure that everything is as expected. And uh, so this is really, you know, the Wi-Fi in here is terrible, so I won't be able to show you, but we can see that here there's, this data is available to a wide range of software, and that includes websites that you upload your photos to. Uh, now this, this data can actually be manipulated, um, but um, don't manipulate it, please, because that's, this, it's, it's not only destructive to you, but it's also destructive to, um, uh, or, no, not to you necessarily, but uh, it's destructive upstream. Whenever you upload the photos and someone tries to look at it and view the metadata, uh, it's interesting to them usually to be able to show it. So if you don't want them 
to see how you took this photo for whatever reason, then you may want to remove it. But certainly for this class, uh, whenever you upload photos, uh, you should make sure that this data is intact. And, and if you don't do anything to the photo when you upload it, then there's nothing to worry about. The data will be intact. But if you open it in Photoshop, for example, even when you resave a file using Photoshop, it will append additional information saying that it was written by Photoshop. And so uh, it's, it's obvious for people to tell when a photo has been uh, manipulated or at least opened and resaved in Photoshop. 